What's up? <laughs> can you hear me? I can. I think I did all the right audio stuff. Can you hear me? Can everyone? I can hear you too. And uh, Coconut Milk was actually one of the backup singers to the band that put out Who, 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 Let the Dogs Out. That was, he was in there. He was in that band. I that remember. Band. Well, you're right. I went, I saw him when he tried a solo career. <laughs> um, Coconut Milk. Uh, he was the I only white guy in the, in the backup of it. It was <laughs> <laughs> That's what he comes to say. They're like, give it up for a backup band and coconut milk. And he, he had the he had he had the weird distinction of being one of the few white Jamaicans uh <laughs> in the in the band. <laughs> uh if you've ever heard speaking of government secrets, if you've ever heard the history of who let the dogs out, it's pretty fucking amazing. Really? Various versions of I think I I think I heard it on 90 the podcast 99 percent invisible. Various versions of who let the dogs out. There's like 10 or 15 versions. And many of them came out around this, like within the same span of like two, three years, unrelated to one another. How does, because it looks like they were, it seems that they've tracked it all back to something that was being chanted at like, it maybe even started at a high school football games and then went to college football games. So there were a few teams that would like, when they're in the huddle, they'd go, who, who who let the dogs out? And then they'd run out on the field. And it inspired various musicians, like a DJ started using it. And then people heard that and wrote songs. Anyway, you end up with like, with like five to 10 legit versions. And then like 15 to 20, if you include like side little versions. <laughs> well, this is probably our most amazing government secret to date. I I'd think. say, I'd say so. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Government Secrets episode 21 with Lee Kerf and Graham Elwood. <laughs> Who let the dogs out? Her, her, her. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't a, gonna be an action-packed show. I think we're gonna um, we're gonna talk about. I know you want to talk about a government secret about the the real history of the Cold War. I want to talk about the yeah. real history of Christmas. Um, oh, nice. We just gave a bonus uh, who let the dogs out government secret. But before that, leaf update. <laughs> Hold on. I was promised in the last episode we were done with leaf updates that the leaf that leaf gate had been solved and put to bed. OK, so this is what we'll call this. A, we'll call this leaf epilogue. Uh <laughs> Wait, so it's leaves and logs. It's a whole environmental catastrophe, really. <laughs> it's <clears throat> so they took my rental. They took my, there was a, a Friday they were supposed to get my car. They didn't. I was like, call. I, and I, I was like, oh, I just was supposed to. Was, I had this whole thing planned out. We're going to meet the tow truck guys, give them the keys. My, the, the leaf was right next to where the rental car place was. <clears throat> my buddy was picking it up. Wait, so a leaf actually requires a tow truck? I thought a guy could just come and put it on his shoulder and, you know, walk off with it. Well, it's one of those, like, front baby strollers. Like, he's, <laughs> he carries it like a papoose, like a baby. Yeah, wrap. Right. Um, but he's still a two-guy job to get it into the wrap. So um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you need a spotter to get it up in the in – yeah, the... yeah. <laughs> yeah, It's like a deadlift. You know, it's a – it's at least a hundred pounds for a leaf. Um, so. I pictured like a Bulgarian guy shows up, puts it on his shoulder and walks off. And then you say, thank you, sir, for taking my leaf away. <laughs> and he goes, you are unsweetened coconut milk. And then he walks <laughs> off into the distance and then there's a shooting star and then light. Um, it's so <clears throat> there was like, no, Oh, we can't get a hold of the tow truck guy. And I was, I had the day off and I was like, I'm going to go surfing. My, I was just like, and so I just turned the car in and I'm borrowing another friend of mine's electric car. Um, cause we all know each other. <laughs> and, <laughs> all you electric car owners. We well, all know. You know what? You all met at the green juice place. Yes. You, well, were, all, you, were, all, you were all there in line and you were like, Hey guys, let's go in together on a leaf. And so, <laughs> We have like a leaf share. It's, you know, you know, standard well, stuff. It's a little weirder. It's more like eyes wide shut, but for cars, it's electric cars. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
I just said the hell with this and I left this and I'd been pretty cool. I had to push back, obviously, as we know, to get extra money from the insurance company, but I was never rude with anybody. But I, I was sort of last straw on, on la a Friday, a week ago. I was like, I left this message for the woman from the insurance company. I go, uh, I've been waiting here. There's no word from the tow truck company. Uh, I'm not going to be inconvenienced by this one more second. Have a great weekend. And <laughs> That's you. You're, you're the sweetest person alive, Graham. The fact that 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 to you was that was really pushing it right there. That was she. She pushed you to the brink. You said, "I'm not going to be inconvenienced." One more moment. It's not that I'm the sweetest person in the world. It's that I have an insane cauldron of rage and swear words behind every action that I take. So I have to really work hard with the vegan smoothies and the yoga to not just be a raging psychopath. You know I get I mean? it. So, so you're looking at this as kind of like uh, you would have, you know, you'd be off the wagon if you uh, screamed at her. It's like you've, you've, yeah. you've changed your rage ways and right. I you don't like want to open up the gates. I don't. I'd be like Robert De Niro in Midnight Run, and I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> so, um, so have I you seen. Have you seen Falling Down? That's when Graham doesn't get his green juice on time. When the green juice, when there's like a five minute delay at the green juice line, I just get a bag of weapons and just lose my <laughs> shit across the city. Um, so I turn in the rental car and I went surfing and I let it go. I was fine. And then uh, apparently, they picked up the. They just picked the car up and just put it on their back or literally they didn't even need the key because it's a leaf. So they just, the tow trucks can just like pick, put it up in a pocket <laughs> protector or something. Um, and, and I thought I'd be chasing down the money for a while, but I've got a big portion of the money back today and it's done. I turned in the keys. I turned in the rental car. So I'm just driving my friend's electric car. And, and I think- do you have a serious committed relationship now with the woman that ran into you or no, 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 no. no, no Damn that, it. Never that never happened. Damn I, just, it. I texted her a couple of times. Like, Hey, are you okay? She's like, yeah, I'm fine. Thanks for asking. And that was that. And, and was why like, are you outside my window? Yeah. <laughs> I'm the guy with his shirt off in your swimming pool. You know what I, mean? uh, but I don't know. I'm, I just, I'm just checking to see if you're okay. <laughs> um, so that's it, Leaf. That's now it's done. Put it in the books. All right. We can, we can leave, 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 leave Gate truly put to bed. This is it. Yeah. We promise. Leaf Gate, the final segment. <laughs> the final, frontier. final frontier. Oh, God. I, f I feel like you're going to pull an Indiana Jones and there's another one's going to show up like 20 episodes from here. They're like, they're back. And he's 74 and trying to run fast. <laughs> You never know. When I picked up my check from the car dealership, there was a leaf on the lot for sale. Anything. There we go. Happen. There we go. Could happen again. You know, maybe they'll I just got to trade in my coconut milk and we'll. Uh, I think so, you could, I think you can put coconut milk down as a down payment for a leaf. I think that's considered. Oh, absolutely. It runs on coconut milk, doesn't it? You just pour it into the tank like uh, Doc Brown and Back to the Future. You just pour it into the. Yeah. Yep. It runs on that and unicorn whispers. <laughs> All right. So you want to? That's, that's interesting because Hummers actually run on unicorns. You just yeah, ground up unicorns, ground up <laughs> and puppies, and yeah, the screams of small children are what <laughs> Humvees run on. Um, All right. So let's do government secrets. Uh First official segment after the bullshit about coconut water. And <laughs> Uh, I well, I was wondering whether we should just spend uh, like three minutes. I, I assume you've done this on your own show, but uh, to do like a topical, little topical thing about um about the the, the campaign that our friend Jimmy Dore has started that has now uh, blown up Twitter and made all liberals lose their minds. Yeah, we should talk about why people are more concerned with being mad at Jimmy than saving lives by pushing for Medicare for all. Right. Or or having some sort of moral core where they're like, I don't care about your corrupt equivocating that you do in Congress. I'm just going to always say we need a vote on Medicare for all. Like, I don't care about the games that you fucking assholes are playing. Just fucking get the vote. Like, I know. 
I don't care. I, I, I did it. I talked about it last. I've talked about it this whole week and watching this happen. I mean, the, so, so maybe you're sick of it, but <laughs> I mean, to see AOC's tweets yesterday about, oh, you're making it harder for organizers. No, what? Be quiet. Right. Like, I just, since this show deals with history, right? We're government secrets. I mean, Lee, you remember all those revolutionary moments in history where they waited till they had a committee yeah. and uh, yeah. they had their step two all ready to go. Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. Every time you see something major happen in American history, uh, you know, Martin Luther King was civil rights. He said, I am not going to demand this till we have the votes. Yeah. And he kept waiting and just sat around and he would he would go in. He would like wait in the lobby of Congress and occasionally have chit chat with someone be like, do we have the votes? Yet? Oh, no. OK. OK. Yeah, I'm going to go home. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of that. I remember Washington crossing the Delaware. He said, I'm not crossing till we have the votes. I'm just going to yeah. sit here on the bank with my feet in the water. And Abraham Lincoln, his Gettysburg address was all about, I don't have, know if I have the votes. I mean, it, it was very clear. And yeah, yeah. with purity tests, I think he said, when, when people were like, slavery is awful, he said, well, I don't have the votes. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's mind numbing. And it just shows you like, and we really, really since March, since Bernie bet, quit, we've really seen that there is no real progressive leadership within the Democratic Party. We got people who are really good at tweeting and giving speeches, but like truly doing stuff, there's it doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. And and just to for those people who might just listen to the podcast and don't know what the fuck we're talking about, um uh Jimmy Dore made a a good point. Uh he made it on a couple episodes before I was on, and then he he asked me what I thought, and I was like, Yeah, sounds good to me. Uh and it was just that like that. The true progressives in Congress, there's only, you know, somewhere between five and 10 of them, depending on how you want to count a true progressive and or close to true progressive. And he's like, they have very little power. These are 10 people, 12 people. But they that's all it would take to withdraw their vote or withhold their vote from Nancy Pelosi to stop her from being able to win the speakership. Uh, and so they should just say to her, we'll vote for you as long as you put a house vote to Medicare for all, even yeah. if it loses, uh, let's just fucking see it. Let's see who's going to support it. Who's not publicly. And, uh, and so he said, let's demand these, you know, so-called progressive Congress people withhold their vote for Nancy Pelosi, unless she offers to have that vote. And, uh, you know, totally fucking reasonable. He didn't say like, throw Molotov cocktails at Congress till they have, give us Medicare for all. Right. All he said was withhold your vote for the corrupt hundred millionaire Nancy Pelosi, unless you get a vote for Medicare for all. And so that apparently was enough to send, you know, liberal Twitter in a fucking frenzy. Like, how dare you uh, request anything of the, of the squad? Like, it's unbelievable why that attitude has been cultivated in America of I need to protect a politician I support from legitimate criticism. I, I, I just I, it's it's insane or, or even demands or even demands. That's not even. Yeah, it's just demand. I want you to vote for this thing that AOC campaigned on. You know, so you said you were going to do this. So I want you to do this. Well, now's not the time. And it's like. The now is not the time thing. I mean, can you tell me a time when there's a pandemic, we're facing the most crushing economic collapse ever that's about to start happening, like in a matter of weeks, um, we're on the pretty close to the front door of a civil war. So the civil war, uh, the Spanish flu, and the Great Depression, all at the same time, we're looking at, but now's not the time to do anything drastic. Right. Like force for Medicare for all. Now's not the time where people could really use something like uh, government paid for healthcare, like right. every other industrialized country in the fucking world. Uh, yeah, now, now's really, really not the time. Not to mention you're about to have a Democratic president, uh, a Democratic House. Uh, possibly Democratic Senate, and even if they lose the Senate with the Georgia races, still it would only they all they you know they'd be one vote, two votes off the 
the having a majority in the Senate. So that's far closer than like 10 or 15 votes. Uh, so that's about as close as you're going to get, considering two years from now, judging from what we know about a decrepit Joe Biden, uh, two years from now, they're going to lose the probably the House and Senate. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's like, when better? This is it. <laughs> this is it. This is our only chance. I mean, there's 15 million people who just lost their employer's health care because they've been laid off from COVID. So when are you, when are you, when is this going to happen? I mean, it's just like, and oh, we need the votes. You know, it's just like, I, I did this video last night. I showed the guy standing in front of the tank in Tiananmen square. I was like, Oh, he's being a little performative. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Did he has, does he have the votes? Does he have a step two in place? He's just, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, and you remember when Nelson Mandela gave those speeches to a lot of people, it's a bit performative, you know, we have to bring that many people like, I know. And he's saying like, we need to do this and that. It's like, did he have the votes? I mean, like uh, when he wrote his memoirs in in solitary confinement, I mean, like, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I, I, and uh, yeah, it just goes to show they can always come up with a horseshit excuses for why this can't get done. You know, Biden's excuse when he was asked in an interview, if it got, if it did get passed, would he veto it? And he basically said like, I would veto it if I didn't see how they were paying for it. Right. And, you know, it was like trillions of dollars, which is horseshit. I mean, you it would essentially pay for itself uh, and save money across the country and save lives and save it's, you know, it's the number one or second cause of bankruptcy in this country. So you just end the second largest or first largest cause of bankruptcy across the country. That sounds like that might pay for itself uh, in in how well our society is doing, how it goes forward, how well people are progressing. I don't think they understand how close they are to people. Just, I mean, I guess, I guess their, their arrogance is, is uh, somewhat understandable being that when are Americans going to like wake up and take to the streets in a general strike. And they kind of, they keep doing it a little bit, not, not. And and so their, their arrogance is so like, ah, we can keep pushing the American people. They're not going to do this, but I don't think they realize in two weeks, two weeks, 19 million evictions start. Two weeks. So I think they're, 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 aren't they trying to say that they're going to extend that or something? They might. Okay. But, but still, the point is the same. Uh, And even without the evictions, the latest numbers are that one out of every three American adults said that they have difficulty, like in the past week, had difficulty either paying bills or paying for food or whatever. One out of three, we're talking 70 million American adults like don't know how they're paying for their next meal or whatever. Uh, I, I mean, that is like, that is the, I've never seen a more fertile field for revolution than 70 million adults all realizing this society, it, it, the way it's situated, the way it's working right now is not working for them. I know. Uh, and it's like uh, an AOC, they're going to, they're, they're going to show up outside of your place. They're going to show up outside of Congress. They're going to, I mean, like, <clears throat> they're like, well, you progressives, you know, you guys aren't willing to concede. I'm like, no, 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 this is the concession. This is the, just f- f- yeah, yeah. Us, us, us not breaking your door down is the concession. Yeah, that's the concession. Forcing Medicare for all, that's the concession. Because what's brought right behind that is shit gets burned to the ground and guillotines start getting sharpened up. So you might want to take this, this <laughs> right. olive plant. This is the friendly version. Yeah, I'm telling you, man. Like, We're giving you the G-rated right here. <laughs> I mean... You want to do door number two? All right. Here come the pitchforks, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's I just I keep telling everybody. I'm sure you've done it on your show, on my show, on this show. Yeah, I, I announce support for for this. Uh, and, and just, you know, I mean, it's just like, do you stand for Medicare for all is what it comes down to. And uh, uh, Cornell West is uh, is announcing uh, MPP support for it. Uh on Jimmy Dore's show and uh, MPP movement for people's party is also creating a uh, online petition that people can sign to see if they can get, you know, tens of thousands to sign on to that. And we'll see where it goes. Yeah. And everybody watching and or listening, call your representatives in Congress and say, you demand, you know, 
to, to the force a vote for Medicare for all and withhold your vote for Nancy Pelosi. That's what you got to do. Um, so, uh, all right. Oh, all right. You, you go first. Take it away. Oh, government secrets segment number. Maybe th we're on the third one. I <laughs> <laughs> we called the last one the first official one. This is this is two A. Two B. B. <laughs> Government secret segment two. Bravo. Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> um, as we are a week away from the beautiful holiday known as Christmas, right? I just wanted to do, and I found this article: the dark history of Christmas traditions, um, and uh. <laughs> this is the this this David Barnett writes in the Independent Peace Goodwill Tidings uh, and Comfort and Joy. Don't believe a word of it. <laughs> There's a more sinister side of the festive uh, um, of the festivities, right? So uh, people have been marking the midwinter for longer than the two thousand years uh, since the birth of Christ, right? Uh, and even that's in doubt anyway, it was only in the year 340 AD that Pope Julius I fixed the date of Jesus's birthday to December 25th. Okay. Prior to that. I like, I, I like the Jesus's birthday and it needed fixing. It was, let's, let's nail this down. Oh, I didn't even, <laughs> no pun, no pun intended. It's so Sorry. great. It's great because it you. Needed, I, the birthday needed nailing down. Uh, As you said it, you, 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 you know, <laughs> you know what that is, Graham. I'm such a fucking comedy genius. It's just in my subconscious. I don't even know it. I don't even know it. Oh, outstanding! Jesus nailed to the cross, pun. <laughs> um, so uh, prior to that, Jesus's birthday was on three different dates: 29th of March, 6th of January, and sometime in June. You remember that? I bet it's because that motherfucker was so greedy. He wanted gifts three times a year. Yeah, he was like pimping out. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, they kept having to change the songs. The first Noel sometime in June. You know, like <laughs> what a hassle. Um, so now 250. So it was 250 years later that Julius' successor, a few times removed, Pope Gregory, gave the job to St. Augustine of converting uh, the heathen Brits to Christianity. So... so Let's get into this. Um, because of the idea of getting blind drunk at Christmas isn't something invented by the Pogues and your dad, there were two major pre-Christian festivals of note which roughly coincided with Christmas. The Roman uh, Bacchanalia or Saturnala and the Yule Fest of Norse countries. The Saturnala began on 19th of December and lasted for the better part of a week, which sounds about right for those currently enmeshed in the Christmas party rush, morality and restraint were politely shown the back door. <laughs> yeah, I, that's what I thought. Wasn't that all about just like, do what you fucking want, get drunk, fuck yeah. whatever's walking around. It was crazy. Schools were closed. No criminals were punished. Slaves were allowed to swap places with their masters and no one was elected king for the duration of the festival. The wealthy distributed gifts to the poor. <laughs> So I'd be fascinated to learn more about the slaves were allowed to swap positions with the masters. Imagining you, you have one week where you're allowed to be the master, but after that, you're going back and being the slave. So how do you want to treat the master <laughs> during that week? Yeah. And I don't know. They, I bet you they got rid of it because some slaves went, you know what we're doing next year? <laughs> we're going to make this a permanent switch. And yeah. uh, so that was one of some of the, ta the the fun things they would do. The Roman god Saturn, in whose honor the festival was staged, was no benign uh, Christ figure or benevolent Santa, even though his party was eventually absorbed into Christmas. Ancient astrologers thought that being born under the sign of Saturn was bad news. <laughs> so um, uh, vestiges of these old traditions and festivals still remain. You probably have some dotted around your house right now. Take the mistletoe up. Uh, parasitical plant that grows on other trees, but which was once thought to have been a fully formed tree in its own right. And which provided the wood from which Christ's cross was made. <laughs> ah, I love the parasitical. That, that makes sense. Cause most of the guys that go for the, I want to kiss under the mistletoe, they're, they're usually parasites. They're not, 
it's it's rare that it's a real it's a real nice guy walking around trying to uh force women into him making out because he's got a plant over his head. Yeah, it's a creep. It's a creep move. And it's not surprising that it's the same wood that they nailed up the son of God. <laughs> so Wait, so did it when they nailed him up, did it have the cute little red berries on it? Or <laughs> yeah. And I think two Romans kissed underneath it. I think yeah, they were like, this is so festive. This is just lovely. <laughs> Oh, but then that's where Bing Crosby came up with that song or whatever. Um, so um, going back further, uh, Norse mythology tells us of a god, Balder, who was killed by an arrow made of mistletoe. So mistletoe has a really sordid, violent history. Um, yeah, it's just stained with blood, mistletoe. <laughs> I mean, it is just... Oh, it represents America. Maybe that's what we should have on the flag instead of the st instead of having like an eagle with twigs we could have a just bloody mistletoe that was mistletoe. shot in somebody's heart. <laughs> yeah so um so this is it um it um, the plant is mostly associated uh with the ancient druids of old england was legend says valued it so much that they cut it from the oak trees and grew it with a golden sickle and catch it in cloak and robe before it hit the ground. So what a bunch of psychos. Like, this is just a weird cult plant. I mean, this is this is like Jim Jones Kool-Aid land. You know, this is really <laughs> creepy. Um, so uh, it was said that mistletoe was banned in churches because of its pagan associations. Banned. Nice. <laughs> um and uh, through the York Minister, which itself has ancient links to the Vikings, used to hold a special mistletoe service where the city's wrongdoers could beg the pardon of the church. All right, so there's a silver lining. Mistletoe has one good deed. <laughs> it did. Um, uh, from when, when are we going to get into all the shit the turtle doves have done? <laughs> the turtle doves were an ancient gang of miscreants that you saw. <laughs> um so, uh, according to old customs, holly, another evil plant, should never be brought into your house before Christmas Eve or bad luck will result. Uh, Christmas decorations should be taken down by the 12th night or January 6th, one of Christ's early birthdays. Uh, but old English tradition says you shouldn't just throw Christmas greenery out the door or death will occur in the house before the following Yuletide. I mean, really, most people I know just toss their Christmas tree out their front door when they're done with it. <laughs> yeah. And you're going to, you're, I guess you're going to, whatever, go to Druid hell or something, whatever, if this happens. In New, when I used to live in New York City, like, you know, January 2nd, you were like knee deep in Christmas trees out on the sidewalks. Like, right. it's just, a, I, I mean, there's another, there's another kind of hidden story, the fucking tree genocide that goes on with Christmas. And it's just crazy to chop down like a hundred million trees or whatever it is. Chop down. I know some people that would always get up a, a planted one. And then when Christmas was over, they'd plant it in their backyard or whatever. But then, but then, You'd have 20 years worth of Christmas trees in your backyard. Yeah. What do you celebrate it every fifth year or something? Like, how does that work? <laughs> you know, or do you just do one of these Druid mistletoe murder ceremonies? And that's how you get, I don't know. what. You <laughs> um, so uh, what's the other thing? Um, ah, the making of Christmas pudding. Now this is more of a British thing. Um, it was once thought to be lucky to partake in the act of making the pudding especially if the pudding was stirred east to west. Why? Uh, uh, laterally, because the three wise men traveled in that direction to pay homage to the Christ child. But in days far before that, because this was the trajectory of the sun God, a deity whose birthday was celebrated on the 25th of December. So far, you've done everything right to ensure a triple-free Christmas, just Christmas Eve and the big day through. So this is the history Um Actually, Christmas Eve is traditionally a time for restless spirits to walk the earth, something old Ebenezer Scrooge and Charles Dickinson's told about. Um, 
should you be brave enough? Legend has it that if you venture into a graveyard on Christmas Eve and dig a hole, then you'll find gold. Yeah, I always stir north, northeast. <laughs> I, I never stir the bad way that causes your death or whatever. <laughs> but I'm all down. I think this Christmas Eve, I'm going to dig up a graveyard and see if I find gold because that seems like. Absolutely. And they, I did a segment on Redacted Tonight a couple of years ago about kind of the, it was like the hidden side of Santa Claus. Now, I, I grew up with uh, both Christmas and Hanukkah. Uh, so we did the whole Santa thing, you know. I believed it until whatever age. But the Santa thing is fascinating because it's, it's kind of like teaching children at a very young age, look, there are some things that all of society is going to lie to you about, and we're all going to work together to do it to you. <laughs> and we're... And like, even if you aren't Christian, you're still, or you don't have Christmas, you're still kind of expected to obey the lie to children about Santa Claus. Uh, you, you don't, not, there aren't many people that are like, well, you know, I'm Muslim, so I'm going to walk up and be like, Santa's not real. Like, you're kind of, it's like, hey, we're all working together here to lie to the kids and to tell, to tell them that this guy, it also kind of uh, creates this wonderful, pro-consumerism myth of like this guy runs around and he gives everybody uh, uh, toys and you just, you know, piles of toys and except it's, you know, only for Christians. So it's specific religion, but also uh, you, most very poor kids don't get much for Christmas either. So it's like, this incredibly generous guy is coming around and giving toys mainly to the middle class or wealthier kids. <laughs> and the poor kids don't get it so much because they don't, they, they, their family has not worked as hard in this capitalist society. So they don't get as rewarded as much. And, and then when you get to the age where they finally kind of reveal it to you, you figure it out or whatever, usually the parents say, okay, you're in on the secret now. Help us continue to lie to your younger brother or sister. Let's oh, keep this. I mean, you wonder like these, ah, oh, these, you know, these preteens and teenagers, ah, oh, they're so angry and surly. Yeah, because the first 10 years of their life, they were in a lie. They, and they just wait, here's adulthood. Everything's a lie. That's what adulthood is, especially in America. I mean, doing this show, it's just like everything you know heard about America is a horrific, blood soaked capitalist lie. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be nice if people took if, but I don't think kids really process it this way, but took the lesson once they figure out about Santa Claus, took the lesson of like, oh, I better reanalyze everything I've been told because a lot of it may be horseshit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think that's what these kids are just like. Yeah. I mean, I remember being pretty traumatic learning there was no Santa. And I just was like, so everyone has been lying to me. My whole family has been lying to me. I'm the youngest of four. Like my whole family has been lying. Yeah, yeah, it's just like a bummer. It's 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 a big bummer, and it's and it's bizarre. It's it's tough to you know, you're eight years old, and you're like, I don't. Why would everyone lie about the nicest person in the world? They're, they're like, yeah. yeah, that you know that the nicest, you know, most giving human being you've ever heard of doesn't exist. That's not. Yeah, just, we don't. That, we'll that giving and love and the whole world is connected. That's a myth. So <laughs> you need to steal some shit and go to work. So good luck and slug it out with everybody else fighting for your toys or whatever. It's just like, what a, what a monstrous thing to teach children. Like we're going to prey upon your innocence. Right. All of us. Right. Just because we think it's cute and, and we're all like snickering because ha ha, you know, this is, this happened to us or whatever. What it like, it's just like intergenerational trauma. It's horrific. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 the, the Santa myth is kind of bizarre. I mean, it's not. And I think, you know, you say these type of things and people are like, Oh, come on. You're ruining the spirit. And it's like, look, no, I'm totally down with everybody giving and caring and loving and, and spending time off work and all. Yeah. Do all that. 
But there's no reason that has to include a giant lie to your children that, that, and, and you know, if I had a kid, I don't know what I'd fucking tell them, but <laughs> I, I don't know that this is the best system. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, I'd be like, look, a lot of your friends talk about Santa and it's like, is Santa real? He's a fun fictional character. Like he's fun. You know, but, like Superman, like, like Superman. He's not real, but he's fun to talk about and enjoy. Right. You know, that's what I would do. Like, let the kid have fun, but make him sure. Like, this is a fun fantasy game we're playing, not a horrific lie that's going to scar you for the rest of your life. And oh, by the way, he's watching you all of the time, all of the time. And he knows when you're not here. Nice. Like it's just, you just see the whole tactic. It's, just it's, it's, it's really, it's prepping children to be ready for the surveillance state. <laughs> Get ready early. Yeah. He knows when you're asleep. He's watching <laughs> you through your smartphone. So be good for good. <laughs> oh. <laughs> He's listening to Siri. He's listening to Siri. He's storing all your data in hard drives that Jeff Bezos was paid six hundred million for. So you better make a bargain. You, uh, you gotta, you gotta update that number because they just signed a new deal that's tens of billions. So. Oh, good for them. That's so yeah. good. I'm so happy. And, and now I think the other companies got jail. I, no, I honestly think what happened is the military realized that having Amazon under their thumb with that contract was useful. So they've now spread the love and it's, it includes IBM, uh, Amazon, Google, and like, uh, Microsoft and Oracle, like all of them. <laughs> oh God. Oh, they're like, yeah, you, well, no, you're welcome to, you know, uh, allow critiques of us here at the CIA. Uh, but you know, you might lose the $10 billion deal we have with you. Yeah, that might be weird. That'd be a bummer if that went away. So oh, yeah, totes. Totes. good bar goodness. <laughs> totes bummer. <laughs> All right, let's do uh government secret segment number three. <laughs> Lee Camp, deep dive into the Cold War. <laughs> <laughs> the sound effects for each uh, chapter of government secrets are they're kind of like snowflakes they always impress me there's no two the same yes. they, you you come up with sounds i've never heard before each time it's <laughs> That's amazing the software it's uh there's an uh, the algorithm it always finds a new a new sound so each segment has its own unique snowflake type sound effect so let's get into who started the Cold War, but spoiler alert, we'll also get to talk about who started the CIA, who what? started the Defense Department. I, uh, I'm shocked that the CIA is somehow involved in this segment. I am <laughs> shocked, Lee Camp. We get this is kind of this is a, this is several government secrets in one, but uh, it's got some of our characters from last week, some of our fun characters from last week, like Henry 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 Wallace, who uh, was was the good guy uh, fighting the the evil villains last week. Truman makes a reappearance. Churchill, oh, nice Winnie, <laughs> Winnie Church. Uh, so. In order to think about, in order to figure out the Cold War, you got to remember. All right, you get done with World War II. The U.S. has just dropped these atomic bombs, which we cleared up last week. Did not need to be dropped. They mainly, it was mainly to uh, show the Soviet Union who's boss and that we can fucking dominate them if we want to. Um, you also have to realize the Soviet Union lost twenty million. Well, it's I think it's closer to twenty seven million people in World War II. The U.S. lost less than five hundred thousand. Uh, so, and here's a quote from JFK towards the end of his life, not by mistake. Um, I, I I think this I think these type of thoughts and 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 statements are uh, are what led to uh, no more JFK. Uh, so in a in a famed speech, well. Famed now, but the U.S. tried to cover it up. But it was a speech to a Amer I believe to a, at American University within maybe two months of his his death, his murder. Uh, President JFK said, "Quote: No nation in the history of battle ever suffered more than the Soviet Union in the Second World War. At least twenty million lost their lives. Countless millions of homes and families were burned or sacked. 
a third of the nation's territory, including two thirds of its industrial base, were turned into a wasteland, a loss equivalent to the destruction of America east of Chicago. So, yeah, you, 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 you finish World War II and that, this is the where the power structure stands. Meanwhile, the U.S. Uh, at the time was producing 50% of the world's goods and services and uh, had, you know, two thirds of the world's gold reserves, three quarters of its invested capital. So U.S. doing great, Soviet Union obliterated, but rather than be like, hey, this is a good chance for us since we have the power to, uh, you know, ease tensions, to uh, uh, deal with arms control since we know that, we, like the scientists and everyone in the U.S. basically knew that it wasn't long before other countries got the nuclear bomb. It was just a matter, like it was mathematics. And even without spies smuggling schematics, it wasn't, there wasn't going to be more than five years. They knew that. And so uh, this would have been a good time to uh, like work on arms control, work on like nuclear arms control, like make sure this shit don't get out of hand. Uh, but instead, the U.S. basically used it as a chance like and there were discussions about which way to go and kind of way to deal with it. And instead, the U.S. went towards like we've got the power. Let's fucking be hungry. Let's. uh uh, grab what we can. Um, oh, and this is kind of a little side note. I just thought you'd enjoy this, how the New York Times has been a, a pile of shit since back in the 40s. Um, <laughs> I assume well, since well, it's <laughs> invention. Secret bonus. New York Times has been a pile of shit for eight decades. <laughs> <laughs> so they were having an like, internal cabinet meeting about the discussion I was just talking about and Wallace was in that, in the meeting and uh, he's, you know, he's speaking for peace. He's speaking for let's ease tensions. And the, basically the other side that wants more war and wants to sideline Wallace leaked, someone leaked a phony account of the cabinet discussion to the press. The next day, the New York times dutifully reported that Wallace had proposed sharing quote, the secret of the atomic bomb with the USSR. Oh. Though Truman immediately repudiated the false, the flagrant falsehood and set the record straight, Wallace could, Wallace could see the writing on the wall that like they were already trying to tar him as a, a tar and feather him as a Soviet sympathizer and get him out of government. Um, so... Then there's Churchill. So, real quickly. Yeah, I'm go sorry, ahead. But the United, whatever, the United States, there's so many of these show episodes we've done, like the Wallace one that we've done, where it's just like somebody that's had a really, like looking back on a, on a life that's like, why, where did it go so wrong? And you're like, well, there's a couple spots. It was right. There was yeah. right here. There's like that time you decided to take those drugs, or you went to Vegas with uh, your whatever your mortgage money. You know, like all you blew. These are the big three, and it's like we have so many. Like, oh, we if we just could have, we could have brokered peace with the Soviets. We wouldn't have an arm. We would have just done. Oh God, it's so like, and we learn yeah. nothing. We're like the guy. We all have a friend like this who's just a perpetual fuck up and is always blaming somebody else. You know, and he's like, man, the DMV fucked me. The lady did DMV fucked me. And then you unpack the story and it's like, no shithead. You were nine months late with your registration. That's not that lady at the DMV's fault. You're a fucking drunk idiot. Well, man, that man, that one guy's fucking car. The, he was fucking, no, you smashed, you smashed it. You were drunk. You didn't get your registration. You got fired because at the Christmas party, he hit on the boss's wife. This is all your problem. Like this is all you created all of this. Yeah. Except with one caveat that the truly like evil shitheads at the top have benefited. Like they have largely gotten what they wanted. So I, I I mostly agree. I it's I, to me it's kind of like uh, and it, you know somebody who's addicted to gambling and they won tons of money and you know so they're a multimillionaire. But through it they lost their wife, their kids, 
Right. Uh, no one in their family will talk to them. They're a drunk, uh, like, a, you know, a bad drunk. Their, their life is basically ruined. But you can tell that even as they're lamenting all of this, man, that happened, that, that, you can tell that they're pretty glad that, you know, they got the million dollars and that, that's really what they wanted that, <laughs> at the end of the day. At the end of the day, I you know I get a free suite whenever I'm in Vegas, so it's yeah. kind of, uh, awesome. Yeah. What? This is horrible. Your life is in jambles. Um, yeah. All right. Sorry. Uh, okay. So here's another uh, government secret tangent. In the the U.S. was already dividing up the the world and like the oil reserves and stuff even before World War II was over. In 1944, in a 1944 meeting with the British ambassador, Roosevelt drew a map of the Middle East oil holdings and informed Lord Halifax that Iranian oil belonged to Great Britain, Saudi oil to the U.S., and Iraqi and Kuwaiti oil to both. Uh, and Truman under, later, Truman understood the importance of maintaining U.S. control over this vital resource. Uh and uh, they called it, quote, a, stu a stupendous source of strategic power and one of the greatest material prizes in human history. So even before the end of World War II, we were already like had a map of the world go, you know, pointing at oil going, got it, got it, need it. Ours, yours, ours, got it, need it. Uh, I, I, wonder, I wonder if anyone in the room went, but sir, are those aren't, aren't those sovereign lands. Isn't it their resources? And they, ah, ha, 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 they all just yeah. laugh. And say, yeah. oh, all right, go run us and get us some coffee. You're hilarious. They're like, who let this guy in the fucking room? They think it's their own resources. This guy's hilarious. Like, <laughs> oh, we just brokered, we just ended World War II. We, we should be brokering peace all over the land. Ah, no, 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 no. We're going to set the world on fire and make a profit. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> so, uh, as to who really was the initial force uh, behind kind of the this such a such a strong anti russia sentiment despite the fact that they had won world war ii and that they were our allies and that they had stopped the germans uh and the you know the nazis uh i'd say it goes largely to a combination of churchill and uh someone else who i'll get to later but uh the the first defense secretary but truman also like as we kind of talked about in the last one, he was, he's kind of always been like a, a sad, pathetic human being. Most of his life, he was put into the presidency, kind of like stumbled ass backwards into it. They were like, well, we got to stop Wallace. So we'll put in this guy. No one's ever heard of. Uh, and he really, it seems like he was looking for other figures to be his leaders. And he definitely took a lot off of Churchill. And so Churchill uh, after World War II, was itching for a confrontation with the Soviet Union. He was a rabid anti-communist and an unabashed imp uh, imper imperialist. Uh, Churchill had tried to draw the U.S. into military engagement with the Soviet Union as far back as 1918. Jesus. So then, uh, skipping ahead a little, uh, not by many years. Oh, wait. Uh, I did want to say this. Uh, Wallace said, quote, the only kind of competition that we want with the Soviets is to demonstrate that we can raise our standard of living faster during the next 20 years than Russia. We shall compete with Russia in serving the spiritual and physical needs of the common man. <laughs> Could you imagine? Wait a minute. Who said that again? Henry Wallace. Same uh, guy. The, the, the guy who keeps getting forced out, drummed out because he's tr he's speaking for peace. He's speaking for like... Hey, I got an idea. What if we were to just prove our society was better by like helping everyone? Right. <laughs> and they what were like, what? Better. They're like, what? They're like, what? No, we got to bomb and steal oil. You hippie. Get out of here. Like, oh, like, geez, it's un. And that's. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bummer when you sit here and you think like, wow, we're on the precipice of complete climate collapse and the end of, of end of humanity. Could have been different, but you know, thanks guys. <laughs> thanks. I hope, I hope your stock portfolio really, you know, is going to go through the roof. Like it's really, uh, it's really encouraging to see. That That's true. What will the stock portfolio, their stock portfolio look like after the end of days? Cause, uh, 
I'm sure it'll be pretty good. I mean, uh, that's, <laughs> they're going to bring a lot of value to their shareholders, Lee, and that's what's yeah. important. That's so, true. That's true. Um, so I wanted to read uh, this quote. So they, so the U.S. pushes forward in more nuclear testing, creating bigger bombs, right, rather than uh, you know cutting off uh, nuclear bomb creation and testing. Uh, they do a massive explosion in uh, the, the Bikini Islands in 1946. Uh, and so uh, Lewis um, Mumford, uh, who uh, after that test, he said he wrote, uh, he wrote, we are in America, and I, I love how similar this is to so many things today, or how this could be applied to so many things today. We are in America are living among madmen. Madmen govern our affairs in the name of order and security. The chief madmen claim the titles of general, admiral, senator, scientist, administrator, secretary of state, even president. And the fatal symptom of their madness is this. They have been carrying through a series of acts which will lead eventually to the destruction of mankind under the solemn conviction that they are normal, responsible people living sane lives and working for reasonable ends. Soberly, day after day, the madmen continue to go through the undeviating motions of madness, motions so stereotyped, so commonplace, that they seem the normal motions of normal men, not the mass compulsions of people bent on total death. Without a public mandate of any kind, the madmen have taken it upon themselves to lead us by gradual stages to that final act of madness, which will corrupt the face of the earth and blot out the nations of men, possibly put an end to all life on the planet itself. That could apply to so many things going on right now. Climate change, nuclear bombs, environmental destruction, capitalism in general. Like, and I'm sorry, who said that again? Uh, Lewis Mumford, uh, he wrote it in an article in the Saturday Review. God, if that guy hasn't summed up the world we're in right now, uh, you know, no one, no one, that no one has summed it up better. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. And, the, and, and they always claim we're doing this for safety or this or that or the American way or what. No, you're, you're going to kill all of us. Right. And it's treated as if it's, yeah, it's treated as if it's normal behavior. It's like, no, it's psychotic behavior. That I, I mean, I feel like I look crazy doing it, but like so often on Redacted Tonight, I'm like, I'm like, this is not like a little debate about, oh, should we have, uh, should we keep bombing infinitely or should we not? Oh, we should. No, one side of this is fucking sociopathic. Yeah. And we shouldn't act like it's normal. We shouldn't act like, like, oh, you know, Biden supports uh, this war. It's like, no, that's fucking psychotic. I know. And then we're made to look insane. I mean, then we look crazy. It's like, you're, you're nuts. Why are you doing this? Like why it's, it's like, again, going back to the top of the episode, you know, just the shit Jimmy's taking Again, he's got a lot of amazing people supporting him, which is great. But the people, the people that are like, why are, why is, why are you yelling at, uh, why are you mad at a guy that wants to give Medicare for all? Why are you mad at people that don't want to bomb anymore? Like, why, wh why are you defending people that like bombs and profit from it? Like, I don't, I don't get it. Like, do you, I, do, yeah, I start getting bombed for people to go, oh, I get it now. It's pretty bad. Like, what is it? Yeah, I feel like that was the feeling I had when the New York Times did the attack piece on me. And I was like, I'm sitting here talking about it like everyone should be fed and have shelter and like we should stop killing innocent civilians. And that makes me a bad guy who's, yep. I don't know, siding with the evil villains. Like, what the fuck is this? I know. It's insane. It is insane. I, and I don't. I, I'm beginning to just like not know what to say anymore because it just keeps getting crazier and crazier and crazier. It's and you're the problem. It's like the anti-maskers that get mad at you when you wear a mask. You know, like <laughs> right. Why, why are you mad? Oh, you got your mask on. Um, what do you? Because I don't. I don't want to get COVID. Oh, okay. Why don't you take your mask off? Like they're crazy people. My <laughs> yeah. My favorite was you know people were were 
yelling at me. I think I was at a protest and they saw me with a mask on. And so there's like some comments in the feed that's like, Lee, why are you wearing a mask? You sheeple listen to government stuff. And I'm like, do you yell that every time you stay on the correct side of the yellow lines on the road? I'm not a sheeple listening to your lines. You're crazy. You're you're, you're a surgeon. (laughs) Your stoplights and stop signs, sheeple. Like, Oh God! No, oh, these are you, sheeple not sticking your finger in an electric socket. Fucking pandemic, <laughs> right? It's like no. A lot of these things are like like the idea. Con- There's a lot of government that's corrupt, but the idea, the concept of government is these are things we came together to agree upon so that we could live a better life. That's the concept, and so every <laughs> once in a while, that's what you're dealing with, like yellow lines on the road. This is not this is not authoritarian. We're going to make you stay on that side of the road. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. This is it's just like a better way to live so you're not all killing each other. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm the psycho cuz I don't want everybody to die from nonsense and and I want everyone to have food and clothing and a home and education and a good life. So, call me nuts. Thanks. <laughs> well, I was going to say that whole food stance you've taken is really kind of fucking weird. Yeah, stop just, stop yeah. stop saying everyone should eat no I'm, it's it's i'm sick of it i'm sick of everyone everyone getting to eat is just i'm just tired of it people shouldn't be able to eat <laughs> um sorry right. go ahead uh, there's more to this segment or we don't oh, we haven't we haven't got yeah sorry i know we're at one hour do you have a few more minutes yeah 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 uh yeah there's a few more minutes uh because i haven't gotten to the creation of uh the defense department yet <laughs> so Wallace was trying to get them to stop spending so much on military. We didn't have a defense department yet, but in 1938, the U S spent $1 billion on national defense, quote unquote. Uh, and then by, let's see. Now by that. So after world war two, the U S was spending $36 billion on the budget. Now, keep in mind, that's roughly one day of our budget now or whatever it is. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like, like an hour or something, whatever. Yeah. But uh, so uh, let's see, where is it? Uh, yeah, Wallace then, Wallace is kind of forced out of the government, of Truman's government. He then does run for president uh, basically on a peace ticket, on a let's not have a Cold War ticket. Um, they begin the red baiting. Uh, and the UK asked the US to kind of take the lead. We then have a proxy war in uh, in Greece w- between the US and Soviet Union, where Greece has like a civil war, and you know it's basically a proxy war. Uh, Truman creates the Truman Doctrine, which says the US should basically be involved everywhere. Uh, <laughs> It's, it declares that the U.S. must, quote, su- uh, support, quote, free peoples who are resisting subjugation by armed minorities or outside pressure. Uh, Jesus and Christ. it's like I just watched the Motley Crue documentary and those guys just had sex with everybody. That's what this Truman Doctrine just feels like. Go run around like Motley Crue in the 80s. It, 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 the Truman Doctrine is Motley Crue if they were to have said, We'll have sex with everything that kind of needs a helping hand. Uh, (laughs) And then they just walk up to every woman they saw and go, you look like you need help. Bend over. (laughs) That's the U.S. war policy. Uh, We, we, you know, we will stand in for any subjugated people. Basically, when we feel like it benefits us, we will go to war in every country. Where Uh, anytime, day or night, 24-7. Uh, so then it says the Greek, the Greek Civil War grew bloodier. The U.S. personnel began arriving in the war zone in 1947. They used Greece as, for to test tactics, some new and some old, that would later be employed in Vietnam, such as the destruction of unions, torture, napalming villages, forced mass deportation to concentration camps without trial or charges, mass imprisonment of wives and children, mass executions ordered by military uh, court martials, censorship of the press. So it was kind of a test run for Vietnam. Which is then now a test run for what's happening in America right now. <laughs> right, right. 
<laughs> so, so all of those things are going down now. So, well, this sounds, um, so, uh, Hold on, I'm trying to jump ahead. Uh, okay, so here's where the Department of Defense created. In July 1947, following five months of hearings and heated debate, uh, the the Congress passed uh, the greatest military reform in U.S. history. The National Security Act created the National Military Establishment, which was later called the Department of Defense. Under that, it also created the Central Intelligence Agency. Oh, hey, that's what those guys got. This is their origin story. I yeah, love this is it. This is it. Truman himself feared that the CIA could turn into a Gestapo or military dictatorship. No. Yet, despite no. that, uh, he still approved secret annex NSC4A authorizing the CIA to conduct covert operations. And the agency used vague wording of its charter to conduct hundreds of covert operations, including 81 under Truman's second term alone. Uh, so, yeah, the, C the CIA gets created. It's basically out of control from the word go. Um, they wrote a document to say, hey, let's create an out of control organization. <laughs> let's make them yeah, yeah, yeah. And let them get on. How do we make an out of control organization that really has no checks and balances and can do whatever it wants? I think I got an idea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so then also Israel's in the middle of this. Israel gets created. Uh, we There's a bit of a proxy battle on that as well, but uh, with the Soviet Union. But Wallace then runs for president on like a peace ticket and I don't know if this will sound familiar. He's immediately uh, called a communist, called a communist sympathizer. Uh, re he repeatedly denied involvement in the communist party, but it didn't matter. Uh, on college campuses, he, he was attacked. He was banned from college campuses. His people were attacked uh, by kind of mobs, you know, saying communists get out of here. Uh, and it basically worked. It, uh, he ended up getting very little of the vote because of that. All right, so here's the final, final government secret. Uh, James Forrestal was the first Secretary of Defense. Uh, and it seems that his views were a lot of what helped shape Truman's views on like anti-communism, red baiting, anti-Soviet Union. Uh, it, it, it quote, his, his views helped shape the poisonous climate in Washington in which the Truman administration repeatedly attributed the most damning motives to Soviet actions. Basically, anything the Soviet Union did, we said that must they must be trying to do the worst. They're trying to take over the world. Um, so Forrestal gets kind of more and more out on the edge. I mean, he's so rabidly anti-Soviet Union. Eventually, Truman asked for his re resignation in 49, and he's quote-unquote shattered. He then goes to Florida, has a nervous breakdown, uh, he discovered running through the street wearing only his pajamas and shouting, the Russians are coming. <laughs> this so, is right the house, Dad. So basically, the the position of Secretary of Defense has not changed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, they find someone, are you capable of running through the street saying the Russians are coming with your shirt off? Yes, you got the job. So he's he's kind of medevaced or or shipped back to uh, D.C. to the Walter Reed Military Hospital. Um, they it it be, starts to become a bit of a story that this guy's going nuts. And in order to kind of keep it quiet, rather than putting him on the first floor, uh, which was the mental ward, they put him on the sixteenth floor, where he soon thereafter jumps out the window to his death. Jesus Christ! That's oh God. These guys, unbelievable. Right? Either jumped out the window or something worse. It does seem likely he jumped out the window considering he had tried to commit suicide before in Florida. So I'm going to, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt that they didn't whack this fella to, to shut him up. But uh, yeah. So they, yeah. If you, um, hey, are you still feeling suicidal? I don't know. I might jump out of another window. We got a room for you on 16. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I, I, I'm actually surprised they fired him because it seems like that is a position of this position of secretary of defense. You know, you fucking run around like a maniac saying the Russians are coming and let's see You're doing, you're doing most of your job. Yeah. Or China or Iran or whoever the bad guy of the day is. So, well, that's, 
that's a very amazing gov seek that ties in a lot of previous episodes of government secrets i love that government secrets end of episode <laughs> Well, that's awesome. Lee, where can people vi view and visit and enjoy all of your leanness? Yeah, thanks a lot. Good episode, man. Yeah, um, episode 21, lock it down. Oh, that means we can finally drink. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm going to finish this episode done. I'm going to run on the street and yell the Russians are coming. So. <laughs> well, it would be amazing if from every episode 21 on, I'm just plastered. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, uh, yeah, all my stuff's at leecamp.com. I have a TV show called Redacted Tonight. Uh, I have another podcast called Common Censored and Moment of Clarity. And uh, yeah, it's all leecamp.com and, uh, and rockfin.com slash leecamp. Yeah, cool. And uh, watch my show, Political Vigilante, on YouTube. And of course, you can get everything at grahamelwood.com. And I'm also on Rockfin. So uh if you go to Rockfin, it's free to sign up. And if you want their premium content, it's $10 a month. And you get Lee's bonus content, mine, everybody on the platform. You get all their bonus content. Ron Placone, Convo Couch, Nico House, Kim Iverson, Whitney Webb, Jimmy Dore, uh, on down the line. So check that out. And, of course, if you're listening to this in iTunes or Spotify, like it. Give it a positive review. And spread the word because we're only 21 episodes in and we want it, we want to keep doing this. So um, and a lot of our shit is evergreen. So go back to the earlier episodes and binge listen. Yeah, because now there's a through line of all the evil, the CIA <laughs> evil shit that they've done. So you really want to you want to understand this this origin story. You want to see all the great stuff they've done prior to that. Um, so it's it's or after that, rather. Um, all right, group. Well, thanks for thanks for doing another one of these, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, man. See you next week. Later. Late camp. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everybody. Please hit the like button, the subscribe button. Go to patreon.com slash Graham Elwood and rockfin.com slash Graham Elwood, where you can support the show. Also, I have a Bitcoin wallet, a Bitcoin cash wallet, and an Ethereum wallet in the show notes. We're taking cryptocurrency. I have a Coinbase affiliation link. We're going to be getting on some other exchanges. So that's how you support the show. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. YouTube is unsubscribing us at an alarming rate. I have a PayPal button at GrahamElwood.com. I even have a Venmo at Graham-Elwood. There's a lot of ways to support our show. We are getting crushed by YouTube. They're We've dipped under 73,000 subscribers because of YouTube. Thanks for supporting what we do.